Um, so, welcome. Hi, everybody. Um, very excited to be here. I'm usually on the other side of the stage because I'm an event producer when I'm not here. Um, but anyhow, we have 60 minutes now to uh, recap Music Day um, and the program here at the laboratory, which is such a brilliant pun on Berghain, um, here at Republika. Um, and just before we get started, um, really this is a live conversation on stage um, with my wonderful guests and the audience. Um, so who of you is familiar with what a fishbowl is? Anyone, can I have a quick raise of hands? Okay, one there. Um, so maybe, yeah, exactly, all come forward. Um, I'm just gonna quickly explain um, basically what we're doing as a panel, but uh, we have one uh, seat here, which is uh, free, and it's for you, dear audience, um, to join. So um, at any given point in the discussion where you feel you have something to contribute or there's something we're leaving out, um, or you have a question to throw in, please feel free to stand up, get on stage, and take a seat and join us. Um, and then obviously go back to your seat and leave it up to the next one, because the idea is to um, rotate people in and out and hopefully have a more involved and inclusive discussion with all of you. Um, by the way, I'm also, I'm speaking English. I know we, we're we partly German here, right? At least like four or four well, of a half of us. A reality check. Uh, who needs a, a, an English panel? Or should we switch to, all right. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm we'll happy have, to stick we'll in English. A, maybe Dinglish, Dinglish panel. <laughs> exactly, the Dinglish panel, great. <laughs> yeah, worth a try. Um, but if you do have questions, please uh, throw them uh, at us in either English or German. Um, we'll answer both. Um, so I'm here with my four great guests, and the idea is to really reflect uh, on today's program, what were the key insights, the key learnings, what can we take away from... Uh, we have heard so much about virtual reality today, about um, startups in the music tech space, um, about apps as a new marketing platform, uh, for musicians, and um, we're really here to condense uh, it all and extract some of the insights that uh, we have learned today. Um, so I'd say let's do a quick round of introductions, and um, maybe we can start with you, Eric, and uh, you can say a bit where you come from, what your background is, um, and Boom. what brought you here. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm uh, Eric. I um, work with um, Music Pool Berlin, and um, we uh, do consultations for musicians in Berlin. And um, beside this role, um, I also uh, I'm also involved in curation of events here in Berlin, focusing on on music and tech. I'm Roxanne Debastian. I'm a singer songwriter from London. Um, that's mainly what I do. <laughs> I'm also part of an artist organization called the FAC, that's Featured Artists Coalition. So that's a group from and for, um, from and for artists that, that do uh, lobbying work and aim to give artists a united voice. And they also do loads of like educational grassroots events. Hello, I'm Pavel, and uh, I'm a musician and songwriter. And uh, I'm here with Soundtrap, which is the recording studio online. And uh, Vani did a presentation about Soundtrap just recently. And uh, yeah, I work with marketing and communications with Soundtrap. And uh, yeah, that's me. Hi, I'm Horst Weidenmiller. I'm the founder of K7 Records. We founded 85. So we went through everything which happened to music in the last year. So I'm here and happy. I, we also we run three labels, which is called K, which is K7 Strat and House. We run a label service department where we take care of about 25 labels. We run a management company, and we work with 30 people out of offices, Berlin, London, New York. I'm personally a founder of the Global Rights Association organization, Merlin. I'm also on the board of the European Independent Association, Impala. And uh, yeah, and I'm here. Cool, thank you. 
So a really diverse group of music experts, all from different fields, though. Um, I was wondering, because we have heard so much about um, music uh, being influenced by these new technologies today, especially virtual reality. Uh, what is, uh, what have you taken away from this? What, um, what are the new technologies that you foresee defining the future for the music industry? Do you want me to start? <laughs> um, uh, one, of, one of the important takeaways for me um, something um, that I had a feeling for beforehand, but I, when I heard it today on, on, on one of the panels, I was like, okay, I'm, I was damn right. <laughs> uh, I just had the feeling that um, this whole uh, virtual reality um, thing, um, which totally reminded me of like this um, um, second life hype uh, back in the 90s, um, might, be a, might be a bubble. Uh, and um, my feeling is that um, this um, augmented reality um, approach to rather um, get some more context um, into your um, um, music um, feeling um, seems to be much more relevant from, from my point of view. And I think this was like definitely something uh, I, I'd love to um, stress and, and push forward. So wh what's much more relevant? Can you repeat that? Um, the uh, augmented reality um, aspect. Yeah. Uh, I had this feeling. Um, that um, this could be um, a very important part of this whole uh, story. Horst, uh, I know your label, K7, has been a real uh, sort of uh, cultural referent in terms of um, taking up um, uh, the visual side um, and combining that with audio very early on. So um, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with uh, the Xmix series uh, that K7 did in what I think the early 90s. Um, maybe you can tell a bit about what that was and um, how you started it and how you're taking it. We had a quick chat earlier on about how you're taking that further and looking into virtual reality also. So we, K7 was, was founded as a music video label and we recorded live recordings of bands like the Nick Cave and Einstürzen and Neubauten. And suddenly this new type of music called techno bubbled up in Berlin. And for me it was like as a video label, that's what I want to produce a video for and the music was done on computers, so the idea was the visuals need to come out of computers as well. And um, you can imagine technology by the days, or by the late 80s, there were just 8-bit Amiga computers, and the rendering of one frame was about two days sometimes. And, um, but what interestingly developed with the X-Mix was that we say, okay, there is a DJ, and this DJ makes a mix of 12 songs, and, and, and these 12 songs come from the underground, they come from what is really happening in the clubs, and we give that music to computer artists in all over the world to visualize. And, um, and that was mainly the start of, of computer animation connected to techno music, and I can probably proudly say that we it created the imprint of what a techno video needs to look like. But more interestingly, what happened to that is that XMix was the only platform for computer art these days because we in total produced 10 videos. We started in the early 90s and ended in the late 90s and we had from Laurent Garnier to Richie Horton to, to, to Dave Clark, all the big, big techno producers. And MTV was really soaking up these videos because by that time there were no, there were no YouTube, there was just all these Euro trash videos and they made all these special shows about the X mix of the real club sound. And, and I think, yeah, on the one hand it was just played on, on all the chill out parties, but on the other hand it was a form for computer art. And I think that made X mix quite special in a way. And we then ended XMix by the late 90s because we had the feeling we need to move on and there are much newer and better concept coming into the market and we wanted to move on with DJ Kicks and our other visions we had and we left visuals completely behind. And for me it's of course 
interesting suddenly now that after that many years to be in touch with virtual reality again because that was we always were referenced to and uh, and new romancer was a bible we all had to read you know and uh, and, and it's interesting. It's interesting that we know all coming back and, 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 and this type of art form becoming so present again. Do you see virtual reality as something that uh, could replace live um, performances in terms of um, I'm sitting in my living room putting on my uh, goggles or whatever, you know, uh, to I have and um, experience a concert live without actually being there. Um, is that something where you see VR's potential or is it more in the, say, music creation space, which uh, we have also heard at the panel earlier on, there are some really interesting works being done in there. I think that, I think the add-on experience, I don't think that um, the experience of live concert which are filmed with various uh, VR 360 cameras are going to replace the live experience, but I think it's going to be a very strong add-on. I've been at that concert, I've been at that festival, and now I want to be the stage camera, and I want to see it from the stage into the audience. That's certainly a strong experience. And I think it, it will come, it will, it will be mainly an additional fan product. I think there is the, the risk of, of, of creating more fan products, that it's soaking up the diversity. Because if, when we know if, for instance, football goes into VR and all the major acts are going into VR, they're taking the money away for people experimenting with new music. And though there could be a concentration, which could be unhealthy for the market. But in general, I feel that VR is adding an, a new element to it, which is a good element. Can I add something very unsexy to that? Um, I, I'm really excited by, by that too. And, and I've been um, at a Paul McCartney concert from the view of his piano, which, which was amazing. Um, but especially for new music, if we really want to take advantage of that, I think the licensing really has to be made simpler. Of course. It has to be a one-click thing, and it's too complicated at the moment. Um, so it's almost like, come on, music industry, get your act together now, because this thing is about to explode, and it's a massive opportunity that we're going to lose out again um, if we don't just make it simpler to, to monetize it. Really, and to have you know have it a one-click license, and to have the payments actually filtered through to the people that matter. I, I, I'm 100% with you, and I think it's it's always difficult when you sp speak about uh, support of innovation, giving away control, embracing innovation by giving rights away. I think it's always difficult if you speak with about the music industry. I think you have to separate the music industry in those who have a business model which is driven by market share. And I, you know, so if you come into a market and you, ha you control 40% market share like a company like Universal, and you, m and you give that license to a venture capital company, you can get a kickback of the capitalization you do, which is multi-million dollars. But these are only three companies who do that. And I think if you go back and see the other companies which are all there, which are very much pro give license away, give embrace innovation and everything. And I think that there needs to be the separation. And I'm 100% with you. We have to make license very simpler. But luckily saying so, licensing nowadays doesn't seem the problem anymore because we have so many new business ventures, music ventures coming into the market, which all get a global license. So I think the days five, 10 years ago, where you couldn't make a license when you came into the market are pretty much over. You just need the capital nowadays to please people with market share. Mm, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, I think um, uh, your, your K7 is definitely um, straightforward um, with regards to uh, new business models, um, I figure. So um, <clears throat> I, um, I have the feeling that you, 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 you might be the, the expert to um, tell us a bit more about like these kind of uh, new business models that, that might be um, possible uh, in this um, whole sphere um, or what you just said like uh, for instance Universal has its um, um, startup unit as far as I know so they 
they already uh, have their platform to uh, to come up with uh, new uh, business models and ideas. But it would be cool to hear more uh, from your end um, what what you guys are um, currently um, planning um, with regards to uh, that kind of um, new business models. I mean, for us, it is more that I think, in a way, nothing has changed in music. I mean, music is creating an emulation of a fan, which then starts to spend money. So, and back in the days, it was vinyls, and and now they, then there came CDs, and now different type of stuff comes, and perhaps it's a VR experience. And I think for us, as K7, we just want to create these these emotions. And, and this is the most important part, and we want to be part of how these, how people spend money and bring it back to us, you know? But so is it just emotions, or is it also like what we heard today, like um, there's a big market marketing um, aspect in this whole technology um, um, aspect at the moment? Of yeah, but, but at the end of the point, at the end of the day... Upselling of course, of course, aspect. No, no, you have, of course, a big marketing machine, but I think what is still happening is that music is touching you, and by the touch of music, you start to spend money because you want to be closer connected to the music. And then there comes the marketing on top of that. And, and I think, I don't know, what, is, what we see is coming into the market is probably more the kind of combination where consumers can become producers. I mean, for instance, if you see messaging, I think there is something where more and more business is coming into where it goes into the direction where people want to attach music to messaging. And there's a blurring line between getting a toolbar, which is pre-produced sounds, which are subject to a license, and creating it by yourself. That's, for instance, something we see more and more coming with Snapchat, coming with music and everything. And I'm just curious, do you think uh, in the future, in the new future, you'll be able to buy, let's say, a special type of concert ticket and just watch the whole concert being at home on your couch? Uh, this, uh, yes. Um, I'm just curious, what do you think if uh, in the near future you'll be able to uh, buy a concert ticket and just watch the, the whole concert, like, let's say, being at home without going to the, to the gig, like this type of uh, application of VR? I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure you can. I think that is definitely what we experience is the consumer choice and how you consume music is completely fragmented and new business model coming in every day whereby, you know, in the former days you only had one linear, one record, one concert and, and hopefully it does so because as more choices you have and the more choices you can give to the consumer as more he finds his own consumption model you already have that to a degree, not virtual reality, but people are already, so I do online shows and there are a myriad of platforms that offer that kind of service uh, where you can either have a set ticket price okay. or you can have a pay what you want. And it's either you could have it a whole thing as an online concert and I'm just sitting in my living room playing songs or I, it, it's not my living room, I try and make it a bit more exciting than that. But, um, or it's at an actual gig that you're streaming live and you can monetize the live streaming of it. So, so that's already been a really great add-on and an additional form of yeah. form of income. And then you just enhance it with a VR yeah. device. Yeah, just if you have a headset, yeah. exactly. Can, yeah. And then it just yeah. would make any difference if you actually add the gig or you. Well, I don't, you are. don't know about that, but <laughs> yeah. So one of the critique points about uh, VR, right, is that uh, it's creating this really private. Um, private spaces and uh, music as we know it has always been a very collective um, experience. Music is there, I mean, you know, you can look at um, its history, it's like a, it's a, it's a collective uh, form of like uh, sharing an experience together. Um, what do you think about that? Okay, now I'm coming back with my uh, augmented reality thing, because <laughs> um, I, I always had the the, the feeling um, that, um, for instance, if you if you could um, implement um, some some music sound stuff in your environment, this would be fantastic and also a wonderful thing to share music with other people. For instance, like just. Um, Put some 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 your song or your tune somewhere in your neighborhood and and, and just make uh, other people uh, explore what 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 you just left there uh, as as a little statement, for instance. So um, I I really don't see this this um, um, walled garden virtual reality thing like with your 
uh, headset on and uh, you all alone with the music or, or whatever. I, I just see uh, rather that you uh, explore stuff in your environment. So uh, I really like this idea also um, with regards to this um, thing that I really love to have more context um, um, coming with the music I, I, I like. And, I, and, and again, I, I see this rather in a, in a, a mix of reality and uh, information or context um, to uh, also for me to consume, uh, to rather um, help me to maybe buy some more things from a band or from a producer rather than being in this virtual reality bubble all by myself. It's almost like going back to the days of having like a record sleeve and being totally immersed into that. And it's really, it's really cool in that way because it's all, I think you've um, hit on a trend there that we heard today for sure. <laughs> well done, Eric. <laughs> um, it's all about added value and like having added, like added information on that. And um, yeah, how cool is that? So even if you do have the, the isolated experience of your headset and in your room alone, experience, that, that's almost like People always say people don't have the attention span anymore to listen to an album. But if you've got your headset on and you're in a virtual reality world of Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, um, I, can, I can see people spending that half an hour in their room exploring that and enjoying it. At least. <laughs> it is a really um, exciting uh, new way of uh, experiencing music as well. Like we heard earlier, it's um, like, especially electronic music um, is something that has always been about uh, forming these soundscapes in a way and that um, already has some sort of like, uh, even if, it's, if that happens uh, in your mind, there is like a, a visual attached to it. Um, so I think uh, it's a very, very exciting technology. Um, that, however, as also we heard today, is like still in its uh, you know early stages, and basically the hardware is there, um, not so much content. Um, and from what I've seen so far, it's really um, in the music space. Um, it's been uh, videos that um, you know you can now sort of with Google Cardboard or whatever. Um, that uh, are crossing the line to virtual reality. And I, I, I think it's important because if, if I could say what I'm really looking for is music which makes you listen to music and perhaps VR is the answer. Because what we, what we experience is that music is more or less an emotional wallpaper. We put it on because we like the emotions but we immediately start to talk and, and we even have the feeling we listen to the music while we talk. And, and I think coming back to what we heard before is about the record sleeve and the experience of going to a record store and being at home and lyric, listening to the lyrics is actually what is missing to me in a way, is the experience where you give 120% of your attention to that music for that moment. And perhaps VR can create that in a, in a new experience where people give full attention, which I think would be great because that's a little bit missing at music, is the full attention. Also, let's face it, it's like uh, super escapist and fun from everything that I've seen today. People have a lot of fun um, exploring virtual reality, at least for the first 10 minutes until they get very seasick. But um, it's been... They start puking. Exactly. It's been like, it's a, it's a fun, exper new way of experiencing music. But um, how about the creation side of things? Um, your startup is basically about uh, bringing musicians together in a collaborative um, environment. Could you see applying VR at some point uh, to that, meaning you meet uh, your co-creator actually in VR and uh, creating together? I mean, definitely, it's, uh, in the near future, it's very possible. Just a short intro about uh, what we're working with. It's, uh, company called Soundtrap and uh, we have a recording studio in the browser and it's a collaborative recording studio which means it's pretty much like a garage band Skype and text chat in your browser in the same window so you do you can uh, play together record together and uh, video chat and chat as you do it so it's all in the same window and uh, of course in a 
some years, if we apply VR to that, that would be amazing. You know, you don't just see somebody in the, you know, in the chat window. You will be able to basically, it's like you'll be in the same recording studio together. So I don't know how much time it will take to get to that point, but uh, that's definitely the, the future of the project as I see it. And uh, currently we have, um, we have quite a few virtual bands on the platform, which means, uh, let's say, um, I recorded some guitar riff and I need to add bass and drums and maybe ukulele at some point. And I would find musicians all over the world, connect with them, invite them to my project, and we would basically design this uh, virtual band together. So if, I, if at some point we all wear like VR devices and uh, play together, that would be mind-blowing. So I think that's, uh, that's where it's all going eventually. Um, last thing on the, I know we're fishbowl guys, <laughs> um, we have an empty chair here, so please uh, feel free to join us, um, especially on that subject of VR, I know that's been dominating Republica, um, or at least uh, the music day, and um, I mean, is it just a hype? Do you have any opinions about that? <laughs> Come <Yes>. and join <laughs> us. <laughs> There's someone. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm no stranger <laughs> to this stage. But, uh, there's been a lot of talk today about AR and VR, which is all very exciting and very stimulating. But we had a lot of buzz about 3D in the cinemas about 10 years ago. Where is that now? The add-on is always interesting at the moment. But I want to come back to something that this gentleman said, because we're missing a point. Music is essentially to be consumed by hearing not necessarily by seeing. Of course, we've always had the live performer, we've had the street musician, we've had the classical concert for 600 years, and we are in a position where we can still go to see rock musicians or musicians play live on stages, thank goodness. We may well explore the opportunity of seeing a virtual reality performance and enjoying the sight, sound, and even possibly the smell of being next to someone that hasn't watched. <laughs> we'll see how far technology will bring us. But I've been working in music and with young people for the last 40 years, and I have noticed one trend, which is quite sad, that in the last 40 years, people have stopped listening to music and are consuming music visually. And that, for me, is a problem in many ways. I don't want to expound on that problem, but I'd like to come back to the point. The basic point is that music is an audio sense. It appeals to our audio emotions, of course, we can enhance that, and whatever technology will come along will be used and will be exploited. Unfortunately, I use that word deliberately. But I just wanted to make the point that let's be thankful that we have wonderful equipment here. Still to be surpassed, not to be surpassed, has not been surpassed by technology. And maybe one small PS at the end of my delivery. Making music and the way that we make music over the last 50 years has changed very little. The way that we consume the way that we market and we appreciate and listen to music has changed far more dramatically than the way that we make music. I've tried rehearsing with someone using Skype. It's not perfect. It can be done. You can send files across the world, but it's not instantaneous. So we've a long way to go about moving into a world where music making is totally digital and doesn't need the human interface. Maybe that's a good thing, but I'm going to stop now. Thank you very much for listening. I just wanted to remind people that we have ears for listening to music with, and long may we continue to do so. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, should we stop here? Or? Yeah, well, let's, yeah, let's go. Do it. Cool. Um, also, the other main sort of recurring theme um, that uh, we've taken from today, I think, is uh, really going back to how technology can empower artists. And um, there's been a lot of talk about shifting hierarchies. Um, maybe uh, what are your key ideas here? What's, uh, what have you taken away from how 
technologies actually can empower startups. And then especially if you look at um, you know, the streaming market, is, it, is technology really empowering artists? <laughs> you know, it's such a, um, I know this is a really broad question, but um, I think, because we haven't uh, discussed streaming at all. Well, with regards to streaming, I think a lot of artists that have spoken out with outrage and against the concept just don't know very much about it and have been very informed. And if you're not very informed, you get scared. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and speak on behalf of the artist community here. <laughs> um, Innovation is, is great, and tech startups and streaming is great, and there's no way of going back. You know, we can only go forwards. I think the problem with streaming is that artists have been excluded in the conversation. How do you define a stream? We still actually don't have a definition of what it should be legally, is it some, because it's somewhere between a radio play and a sale, and it's neither, really. It's something else. But uh, those contracts have been drawn up, and we've got N NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, between those three massive companies and the streaming services, and a whole lot of revenues generated. And Spotify pays out 70% of their income on royalties. But that doesn't trickle down. So yes to streaming, but no to excluding artists in the conversation. So, so that's really where the disconnect is. It's the same with. YouTube, right now in the States, we've got all these high profile, dare I say, quite old school artists saying, boo, YouTube, you're not paying out. Uh, Universal's suing SoundCloud. But I don't think, y yes, we need to look at the safe harbor thing. And yes, we need to go away from tech companies going, oh, it's got nothing to do with me. Well, it's not my responsibility what's on my platform. But um, the innovation is, is good. What I'm, I'm aware that I'm rambling because it's beer time now. But um, the, the, the one thing that gets me is that all these new things are great, but they're just more middlemen between the artists and the audience. And it feels like the person that needs to pay out first is always the artist get this service, then you can do that. Like, this new service will answer all your questions. Be on this new platform, be on this new social media. And I just think, as fantastic and positive as all these developments are, it needs to be, it needs to be streamlined, it needs to be simplified. This new digital age should mean a simpler music consumption for everyone. And that should result, that should result in generating money that will ensure that people can continue to make music. I mean, isn't it also that, you know, the music business is run by big technology companies who are not necessarily, they don't come from a music uh, point of view. They come, uh, what they want to do is to uh, attract more consumers into buying their hardware. Um, so... But everybody uses music like that. You know, um, I'm going to steal a quote from Fran Healy. He was like... Music's like, I'm not going to try and do the Scottish accent, but it's like, music's like candy that people lay out to attract people, like, come to my shop, come to my restaurant, buy my thing. And that's, that's the problem, that that is, the, that is what it does, because it connects on people on such a deep emotional level. But we need to, yeah, recognize and remunerate the people actually creating it fairly. We need to update that whole system. We had a, a roundtable discussion, albeit a private one, um, in research that's taking place now about streaming and where we're at in the artist community with it. And if you look at the rough split, who says that the record label should have roughly 50% of it? That's an outdated figure coming from, like, no, no offense, but that's an outdated figure that comes from a time when major labels still spent a lot of money and time on nurturing and developing acts. And they don't do that anymore. I think, I think, it, really, I think it really depends, Roxanne. I think, I think what you always can say these days is who holds the risk is holding the rights. And that works on both sides. 
if yeah. you're an artist who says, I can take the risk of my career, you're in a position to get 90% of all your incomes. You're talking financial risk Financial here. risk, yeah. yeah. And if you, on the other hand, you are a young artist to say, I could do it on my own, but I would pr I like to have a proper video and I would like, I need to support, you probably end up at the other side of only getting 20 or 15%. And I think what you're saying is very easy to attack, especially, but I think it's always about the risk and the rights. You're right, and I agree with you, but where's the financial risk if the person you're investing in gets nothing until your entire investment has um, been recouped? I think, I, think, I think that's, I mean, that's always down to individual doing contracts and, and, and I, luckily we have now 15 or 22,000 independent labels and we probably have 400 self-releasing chart artists all over the world and you're no longer dependent on the gatekeepers. And I think people who are signing stupid deals should not complain that they signed a stupid deal. I totally agree with you on that, uh, but uh, even the standard indie deal is 50-50, and the 50-50 is you, it's still, in which you have in no other industry, please correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. but even the best indie deal is a 50-50% split on the profits after we've recouped our entire investment. That uh, is a standard indie deal. No, I, I don't necessarily think it's a standard indie deal. I mean, I have deals which are 90-10 to my disadvantage, and I'm happy with that. Well, then and we I can have, have a I, chat and, afterwards. And I have deals which are 90% in my favor, and I think it's the worst deal I've ever done. I think you can't mix one fits all. It's very individual. Where do the artists stand? Where do the risks stand? What is the investment? And that's very individual. And I think there are many artists out there who have a 50-50 deal, who are out there in love for the amount of money Money they make and there are other ones that say we actually should do more I think it's it's I, what I take out today is that the music industry is accused for many things which don't happen and I think that's wrong I think that's fundamentally wrong because nowadays the access to market is extremely flat everybody can self everybody can produce very inexpensively everybody can release their music very inexpensively and you can market your music very inexpensively, your social media, you know. So you have an access to market. And all artists we are signing are self-releasing artists who created their own fan base, who created a it's heat... It's the only way to do it now, it's, really. Who created a heat level which we say, oh, come on, we want to work with you. So I think it's all possible now. And I think we have to be careful of not generalization. And especially if I see people saying, the, be creating a business model whereby uh, the majors are squeezing all artists. I think it's just these days are over. These days are over and I think, and also to criticize you, Roxanne, it's like one thing you said yes. today Go on. is, look, I'm in a company and I would love to have more women in my decision-making processes within the company. If I advertise for a job, I get 90% male application 10% female application, and I struggle to find well-skilled uh, women for my positions. And this problem is not that I don't want to employ them, the problem is it starts with socialization in the childhood. It starts with what they study. It starts with what they... I couldn't decide. agree more. Yeah, absolutely. I had the okay. UK Music Board say the same thing to me about race, saying we would love to have more black musicians on the board, but I can't find any. And it's, uh, yeah, of course, it's an education thing. It's the fact that from, sorry, we're kind of going back to this gender conversation now, right? But it's the fact that from a really early age, both boys and girls are done a total injustice by being targeted, this is for you and this is for you, mm -hmm. right? It's the fact that, um, yeah, girls don't grow up with those role models and they don't grow up with the chemistry sets and the war toys and the, and the robots and the guitars advertised at them. They have the cooking stoves advertised at them mm -hmm. and the pretend Barbie dream house. So yeah, absolutely. It's first and foremost a matter of education and where our society is at and reinforcing that positive role model. We've got to stop telling children what they can and can't do depending on their gender or their race. So yeah, I, I can agree with you more. Okay, on that. now because then I misunderstood your presentation because I saw it a little bit like establishment doesn't give access for women to come into music, and I could say I can only say I would love to have more women, and it's very difficult to find 
good, skilled, educated women in the music industry? Well, I, I, there's certainly no shortage of very well-educated, skilled women in the music industry, so perhaps no, I can they help are, you on they, that. They, they are, but when we see our applications which are coming in, it's we always, because we prioritize uh, female for our positions, and we always struggle to find them. And it's Where do you advertise, out of interest? Uh, we, are, we do LinkedIn, we do, we do, I don't know, CMU, Music Week. Yeah. You know, okay, just as a quick aside, because I know I feel like I'm monopolizing the conversation here. Um, I was just in the big, in the main hall on a talk about um, our data imprint that we leave and the future of that. And it was so interesting. And it was saying that how... Uh, it was talking about artificial intelligence, and if you typed in a Google search for CEO, what are the top pictures that come up? They're white men in suits. Mm -hmm. And if you fed that information to an algorithm, it, what it would conclude from that is, this is what a CEO looks like. Mm -hmm. And then if you have targeted advertisement for a job in a certain income bracket, they found that, for instance, those adverts aren't served to women. Mm -hmm. So you're actually not even seeing that job ad. So I'm certainly not saying that that's happening with your adverts, but I thought that was a really interesting aside. But yes, I, I, totally, I totally agree with you, except for the fact that, yes, there are, there are a plethora of highly skilled yeah, women out there hopefully in the music more. business. And hopefully more soon. Yeah. I think to some point, though, you're right. It is a socialization thing where uh, you only see women, like especially in the uh, like in dance music, breaking through now or in the past few years, and uh, really sort of appearing on the surface. Where um, I, you know, I like we can talk from personal experience, but it's not uh, something. Uh, girls are not given uh, two decks and a mixer from when they're two years old. <laughs> like when that was like 20 years ago, you know? Like when, when guys get into uh, making music or DJing like they did uh, 10, 20 years ago, um, it wasn't as accessible to uh, women. Uh, it is much more now, I think, and it's definitely changing. But um, I think you do have a fair point. I, w I would like to come back to streaming because um, what I think, what I because we spoke about streaming before, and I, what I think is very interesting in streaming is that we see there are that that every consumer is looking for their own streaming service partner. And I think that has a big potential for the market to grow. And I think it started, what amazed me most is that the Apple Music advertisement was mainly driving Spotify subscription, which means, which clearly showed that the real music lovers and all the music nerds go to Spotify. And suddenly now Apple Music is close to 22 or 30 million. They're going, they have a completely different kind of audience that more goes into fashionable, they go into China because people have iPhones. So we never expected that Apple Music would be able to grow such a fan base outside the Spotify fan base without cannibalizing that. And, and I think it's going to be more and more interesting what comes next. But for instance, if Netflix goes into, into streaming, that's going to be, again, a completely different audience to what Apple Music and, and Spotify has. And one of the questions was what comes next, in, or is there still a market for streaming? And I think, yes, there is, because I think streaming is, is really going into your social environment. And wherever you are is where you want to stream your music with the brand you trust. And I think there's loads of space for new music streaming services. And I hope you guys there are going to program it and bring them into the market. We just had this discussion recently here also with Barbara on, uh, on the Twitter timeline. Um, um, I was just uh, about to ask you, um, we, we, we are seeing like this... Um, this, this big problem of unique content um, uh, in the streaming business, and we see all these pre-release marketing ideas, like Beyoncé um, just um, releasing a new album on, on Tidal, and so you got all these 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 walled gardens again. Uh, each 
so, so my feeling as a consumer is like uh, each um, um, high-profile um, artist needs its own um, app or uh, streaming service nowadays. So what's your, your perspective um, uh, on this um, phenom phenomenon? I, I, th I think the exclusivity is driven by market share. I think the reason why uh, Apple Music and other going into exclusives is mainly to drive their market share up because they, they, you have everything on Spotify. And Spotify is very much against exclusive because they have a lot of consumers. I'm personally also against exclusive, even I'm always tempted to do these marketing deals because exclusives are driving people again back into piracy. Because it's like if you have your 9.99 sub Spotify subscription and you want to have the exclusive and it's not on Spotify, you go into piracy again and then again you're driving people who have a business model of using music but not sharing the, 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 the income. And that's not good for all of us. So I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult one in a way because it's a great marketing tool to be in a position of say I'm giving something exclusive to Apple Music, I'm going to have wallpaper all over my cities, I have access to a marketing budget I cannot afford by myself, but on the flip side of that is you, you, you enhancing piracy. I agree, I think you can do that if you are like Beyonce or Adele. Um, and also, as you were saying, people go with the brand that they trust and you can't change, so difficult to change people's listening behavior. Like a fun, fun fact, I heard that Rainbows, uh, in Rainbows, Radiohead's in Rainbows album that they put out for free or pay what you want was the most illegally pirated album in that month of the release, which only, you know, that's just wherever you get your music from, that's where you're gonna get it from, but yeah. Okay, so we're coming slowly to an end. Uh, again, this is a fishbowl, so uh, if someone has uh, something to say, um, please get up and join us. Um, do you really think uh, there's uh, room for startups to enter the streaming market? Oh, yeah, yes! <laughs> there we go. go. Hello, Mr. Hello. <laughs> So talking about streaming, I'm gonna, uh, I have different hats actually, uh, and now I'm put on my um, user digger hat. <laughs> Exclusives, actually. Um, so I talked a lot with friends. So some of them, in, they have Amazon Prime for movies, but they also have Netflix. So I think that user are more they, they want to pay more for movies than for music streaming, actually. They really do not care if they have three subscription models for movies, but for streaming, streaming is music is just a thing, it's like a candy, you said before, which is really a, a great um, uh, uh, thing. So with exclusives, you don't drive anything. You can, as an indie artist, you can do an exclusive if you want to make a promotion for your new Bandcamp um, account or something like this. But the moment you're a big artist like Beyonce last week, I pirated it immediately. And usually when I steal music, I buy it as soon as it, it's available on my service or whatever. But Beyonce maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> but I think it's very important that we and the future will be that the, 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 the young people, they get wherever they can get it. They, do, they are not loyal to companies. They really don't care. Is it an Amazon? Is it a Spotify? They don't care. They want to hear this Beyonce album because it's the shit. And, and one, uh, adding to you and, and commenting on your, oh, your dad has gone, no, is he still, oh, he's still there, about um, 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 like this focus on, on audio um, content or music is audio. Um, I, I ha always have this 18-year-old um, um, uh, daughter of my girlfriend in mind, and she doesn't give a shit if it's yeah. like audio, video, whatsoever. It's like all the same for her. It's just like music in some form and if you have like the capacities you watch the, the the video but basically you don't care you just grab what you get and another thing i wanted to your your um, the acoustic is really bad here huh 
hard job here. Yes, no, I understand. <laughs> so I really like what you said, but I would like to add one more thing, because with all these new possibilities, um, the music is coming also to people who are not r looking for it. So I think we are getting a new, uh, a, a new audience on top of everything. And the audiophile people, you know, the, the people who are really like this vinyl or the, you know, the quality, they are still there and they can, they don't have to drive, they, they don't have to fly to Brazil to get a vinyl. You know, you can have it at home. So I think it's, it, the audience is growing. What we have to take care of now is just to share the money somehow more equally. This is, and, and to give more transparency to all, uh, behind all these things. But we are in the beginning and so we have a lot of time that um, somehow it will be solved. I mean, pop music, top 10 charts music is a totally different thing we, are, we don't have to talk about. But indie music, I think there are way more people out there now who are willing to pay. And I have a lot of friends and I am really religious, like use Bandcamp, use Bandcamp since years already. And they are talking to me, they are telling me, it's really cool, Barbara, that people are actually buying my music. <laughs> I think on the on the sharing side, I think you know it's like there has been also this um, initiative about the worldwide independent network of signing this code of conduct, how actually music labels are paying their artists, and I think that's the right step into the right direction. You know that we as independent labels we can agree that we share all incomes with our artists and we can agree a fair treatment. And I think organizations like Impala and Win are speaking also to your organization to actually develop a, a, a stamp of actually saying we want to prove something, we want to prove music, that this music is released under fair trade. You know, and I think that's really where we need to come to, you know, to, to actually also be vocal about that there are different types of industries because I'm getting a little bit nervous when I see these industries about the bad music industry. If I could, if I could imagine three, I would say they have a di bit different business model. I would necessarily not call them bad, you know, and I think that's, that's, that's important. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any more questions uh, from the audience? No? Then do you have anything to add? Um, only that I was wondering whether we were going to mention blockchain, but we probably ran out of time now. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we need to make this work for everybody. You know, I think there's a place for certainly think there's a place for labels. I even think there's still a place for major labels. I just think there's no place for intransparency anymore. So, and I do think we've got all the tools now to make it work for everybody. It's just gonna take a bit of shaking. You know what I always wondered, why has Google or Facebook never bought a major label? What keeps them away from that? Why they've never bought a major label? Why would they do that? Because, because, because their business model is based on devaluation of music. Because as cheaper music is, more people are going into using Google, and as cheaper music is, as more traffic there is, as more advertisement Google is going to sell. So there's a conflict of interest between people who are using the emotions of music to drive the value of music down in order to enhance their traffic, in order to sell more advertisement. And that's a conflict people like Google and the content industry have. Google hates copyright because they know copyright makes music expensive. Whatever is expensive has less traffic and has less advertisement. Uh, just just one, 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 one announcement before we, 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 we stop here, because <laughs> there's a, another uh, talk coming up um, right afterwards um, on blockchain uh, technology and the music business. I think you were just about to start. But um, yeah, if you're interested in um, like, um, new technological aspects and transparency, also from an artist perspective, you should definitely stay here and um, see the talk um, coming up now. Cool. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for an inspiring talk and uh, wish you a wonderful rest of the evening. And thank you.